So basically the play starts with like this this two idiots like they're married and they're just reading this play to each other on this Greek temple that they've constructed in their backyard for some reason that's like a hundred years old, even though they live in Tasmania. And their son, whose name is George, I think, or William, no, it's George, I think. Anyway, he goes into the wild with his friend Francis, and he stumbles upon this dead body, who it turns out is the brother of this girl that they meet, whose name is Betsheb. And she's, like, part of a tribe that have, like, lived in Tasmania for, like, three generations, and they came from convicts and, like, settlers, and they all were, like retarded and they had cleft palates and stuff and so she takes them back to their tribe and there's this old woman who called, who's called Air, who's like a storyteller or something and there's this young one called Mac who's like Betsheb's lover or something and then there's another one called Angel who's not very important and she's pregnant or something no she's not I think I imagined it anyway and there's this older one called Milorn who's like the leader and they put on like a play and they try and talk to them but they can't bloody understand their language because it's so weird um, and then like it doesn't make any sense but there's a glossary in the back of the book so you know what the fuck they're saying and um so anyway Francis like falls in love with Batsheb for some odd reason and he also fights the old one called Malorn they like wrestle or something it's like sport but then Malorn randomly dies and so George and Francis are like, all right, let's take them back to civilization. So they do, and they have a dinner party with the Minister for Health or something, um, and he's like, all right, we won't tell anyone about them, because, like, they're retarded, like, the youngest one, Steph, has, like, limbs that don't work, and, like, he's, like, retarded, and they're all a bit weird, and the one called Mac has, like, malformed genitals or something, and so... The Minister for Health is like, we won't tell anyone about this, we won't take it to the press because it's during World War Two, and th that will prove the Nazi theory that people can degenerate in just three generations like they did. True. And so he doesn't want to prove the Nazi theory right. So they don't tell anyone about it and they just ship them off to this um, asylum like close by. And so... Uh, then everything goes a bit weird. Um, Francis goes off to war, um, and Betchab's very sad because they're like sort of in love at this point, which is odd. Um, and then George's father, whose name is William or George, anyway, his father like falls in love with Betchab and spends all this time with her and tries to like win her over and stuff. But she's so out of it, she's like a wild animal that nothing like registers and so he ends up randomly killing himself because he's so upset or something, it's weird but they all think he died in the fire because his house burns down after anyway, um, in the meantime George like spends time with them but doesn't really care all that much for them um, Mac dies, he just randomly kills himself because apparently he's so traumatised by them taking photos of his malformed genitals or something. Um, Air dies because she's old and sick or something. Angel died, like, to begin with, and no one ever talked about it. She just died, and they were like, oh, she's dead. And then Steph dies, um, and Betcha carries around his corpse like he wasn't dead. And the funny thing is, all these people die, but no one seems to actually care. Um, but then... Francis comes back from the war, and him and Betcha, like, talk, but she's all, like, non-responsive, because everyone she knows has died, and she's alone, and, like, she's become, like, glassy-eyed, and, um, so anyway, so Francis is like, I'll shoot her in the head to put her out of her misery, and then he goes to shoot himself, but he doesn't, and anyway, it just fast-forwards to when they're in the wild, and... George is like, you know, she's just going to destroy you like she did with my father. Um, you can't ever have, like, a life with her. And then Francis is so fucked up from the war because he's killed people and all this stuff that he's like, well, what other choice do I have? I can't go back to society. So Francis and Betcheb go off into the wild 
and the end is her going, oh, we're not outcasted anymore, even though they are, and they always were. And that's the end. I actually quite liked it, but it was very odd. Summer of the Seventeenth Dole. I can't remember much about this one. Um, Summer of the Seventeenth Dole. I read this last year. I didn't read it this year. I read little bits. Can't nearly remember an awful lot, but basically... There's this routine that's set out with the main characters. The main female lead character's name is Olive, and she's romantically linked with this guy called Rue, who comes up every year during the layoff season because him and Barney, his best friend, are cane cutters, and every year they get like five months off where they come down from Queensland to Victoria or wherever they live, and they like go crazy because they get paid so much money, they just get drunk and have like a big party every year. And they've done it every year for 16 years. Uh, every summer for 16 years. And then um, one year, the girl who's always there for Barney, Nancy, has moved away and got married because she got sick of it all. And there's a, this book's actually part of a trilogy. And in the second book, you can tell that it's going to happen because she starts getting alcoholic and she's like, I don't like this place anymore. And Olive's like, no, no, stay, stay. But anyway... Um, so Nancy's gone, and that's like a big shock to everyone, and then, um, Olive tries to replace her with this girl who works with her, because they're both barmaids, whose name is Pearl, but Pearl's a bit too, like, uppity for them, and she doesn't really get it, and she's like, well, why do you do all this stupid stuff, and why do you get drunk, and, like, what is so fun about it, and Olive's like, nah, it's awesome, mate, anyway, um, so they come down, and they have a big argument, because Rue has been injured, he like hurt his back up cane cutting and so he had to like stop and he went down to a Brisbane hotel and spent all this money so he's broke for the first time in 17 years um, so Rue's broke, Nancy's gone Pearl does not really fit in because Pearl's like mm, too high class for them which is fair enough because they are a bit of bogans and um, so everything just kind of fucks up and there's this girl next door named Bubba who's been in the other books as a child and she's getting like married to this other guy whose name I can't bloody remember. I think it's like O'Dowd or Johnny or something. Anyway, um, so she represents like the future. Um, but basically, the whole book is just like Olive's decline into shit. And if you haven't read it, it's very odd because it's like the Australian play and it's quite good. Um, basically, Pearl leaves. Barney's like, fuck this. Rue's like, fuck you, Olive. And then he proposes to get married to her. Uh, because he thinks that'll fix it all. Finally, they'll settle down. But she's like, no, I like the routine we had. I like the 17 years of stuffing around doing nothing partying. Because she doesn't want to grow up. She's like a 38-year-old woman. And she just does not want to grow up. Um, and so, at the end scene, she rejects his he, she rejects his marriage. He gets really angry and is like, well, what the fuck do you expect then? What do you want to do? And she's like, I don't fucking know. And then she just cries and cries. And her mother, whose name is Emma, who's actually a very unimportant character, really, is like, there, there, Olive. You should go, Rue. And Rue's like, fine, I'm leaving. And so Rue and Barney just leave together, and that's the end. Stolen. Um, this was actually one of my favourite ones. It really was. I enjoyed it quite a lot. It was quite powerful. Um, so basically, it's a very strange not linear play, it kind of jumps all over the place but there's these five um, Aboriginal indigenous people and they all were in, at one point in the same orphanage as each other or it's, it's a shelter or something, it's for, like for children but they've all been taken from their parents and um, so there's five of them uh, Ruby is probably the easiest one to summarise, she um, so she was abandoned by her mother because her mother went to the shops or something and never came back. And now she's kind of just left in this orphanage. She always gets picked by the white people coming over for the weekend to, um, well, like, she gets forced to clean for them and stuff like that. And so basically she becomes a domestic slave for a long time. And, um, she's very sad about it and the other kids kind of, like, don't really realise or whatever. And, um... She's always crying out for her mother and stuff, and like she just wants to go home. And um, that was quite sad because she just gets abused through the whole play. And then towards the end, her family visits her when she's in a um asylum, 
And they're like, do you remember us, Ruby? And she's like, I've got enough trouble, don't bother me. I've got enough trouble, I've got enough things to do. And so she's just sort of gone crazy, and there's no real happy ending for her at all. And um, then there's Shirley. Shirley's my favourite character, actually. I like her a lot. Um, she is a grandmother and a mother, and her two children, Lionel and something or other, got taken away from her, and so she spends 26 years looking for children. Uh, her, her, her children, obviously. <laughs> and, um, and, um, so, basically, and it's very sad, because, like, she knits the grandchildren clothes and stuff, and she knits things for her own children, but they ne never get to see it until the end, when she gets reunited, and then she's so happy that she has a whole family back again. And, um, yeah, it's very sweet, actually. And so she says that, um, waiting for 27 years, it can't be made up by, um, it can't be made up by having a family back or something. But it's made up by her daughter calling her mum and holding her granddaughter in her arms. And it's nice. Um, and then there's Jimmy, who's, like, always on the run from the law and grew up in, like, a really bad situation or something. Got took away from his mother, like the rest of them. And, um, so he's always on the run from the law and then... It, Later, he's he's kind of like a mischievous little kid, and then later when he's older, um, he ends up in jail, and like he's drunk all the time, and he ends up hanging himself in jail, which is quite sad. And there's this really nice moment at the end where the warden for the jail is like, "Oh, he would have been back here anyway," and like he, as like his ghost or whatever, on stage says, "Maybe, maybe not." I thought it was cool, and um, the one sad thing about Jimmy is that his mother. His mother, who they keep telling him is dead, is actually alive. And then, just as they're about to reunite, and she has all these years' worth of birthday presents for him, she dies. And so it's very sad. And then there's Anne. Anne is, like, looks like a white person, and she was adopted by white parents. And basically she's been raised a whole life knowing that, like, thinking that she was white. And then one day her parents just spring on her that she's part Aboriginal, and her, they know of her real mother, and her mother's dying or something. And so obviously she's quite upset. Um, she kind of holds a grudge against the real, like, against her adopted parents. And um, so basically, at the end of the play, though, she kind of finds this nice balance where, like, she doesn't really fit into either exactly well, but both of them accept her, and so it's good. And she celebrates Christmas with both of them. I think it is. Um, then there's Sandy. He's like a storyteller guy, and he's always running and running and. Like, has been running away from stuff his whole life, obviously, because he's lived a messed up life, like all of them have. And, um, basically he, like, tells stories. He's very connected to his culture. He knows all the history, and he tells all the others of his stories, like the Munji and stuff like that. And I can't remember what happens to him at the end, but I don't think it's that interesting. I think he goes back home into the desert or something. He has, like, a happy ending, but I can't really remember it. Really, yeah. Basically, it's a very good play. It's very short, so if you haven't read it, I would highly recommend that you do. I'm probably, you know, I think I will do my essay questions on it, because it's so... It's short, it's good, and it's quite powerful, and I really enjoyed it. And it's interesting at the end that there's a mix of good and bad endings, which is a lot more realistic than just to... Everyone skips off into the distance and stuff.